Cutting foam, flinching, holdovers, and more this week on Mail Call Mondays. I'm John McCoy with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Well, we're here on another Monday, and we've got a lot of things going on right now. We are finishing up the After Action Report for the Oregon Sniper Challenge, so stay tuned for that. It's got a lot of work going into it, a lot of moving pieces. Since I was actually shooting the match, I did not get a chance to shoot video and photos like I had hoped. Uh, there were a lot of active duty military and uh, law enforcement officers there, uh, so they kind of limited the amount of photography that was done there and kept it to one actual event-sponsored photographer. And so I had to do a little bit of uh, wrangling with him. He graciously offered up his work to us to be able to include in the video. So we're working with that and getting that lined out. So hopefully we'll have something here uh, either tomorrow or Wednesday, somewhere about there for you on that. Laid out in front of me here, we are breaking down the XLR Evolution chassis from XLR Industries. And this is going to be going off to Cerakote, and we'll get that back, and we're going to do a little bit of a write-up on uh, Cerakote, how the coatings hold up, and why that may be a good option for you. So that's why I've got this spread out here. I actually have to wrap it up and get it boxed up and sent out. So that's just some of the things that we've got going on here. As always, we've got a pile of stuff that we need to review. And so we are as busy as we can possibly be. Now, on to our questions. Uh, we have a question from Ryan. Is it necessary to cut the foam in your Pelican case to provide better protection when traveling? Is cutting the foam just for looks? If you do cut the foam, do you need to have it professionally cut, which is very expensive, or can I do a crude job myself at home? Well, a bunch of little individual questions in there, so let's break it down. First of all, if you need to cut your foam or not is going to depend greatly upon the type of case that you get. If you get a Pelican case, there are generally two foam options in the Pelican case. There's the standard foam, which is just a sheet of foam, and then there is the pluck and pick foam option, which the foam is pre-scored into little squares, and you can go in and peel those little squares out, and it gives you a grid-like pattern on it. So you can actually pluck the squares out and get a squared off shape for your rifle, optics, etc., whatever you're carrying in there. The pick and pluck foam is usually on the smaller cases. I don't know that I've seen it on the larger Pelicans, but the Pelican that I use to carry my uh, handguns has that type of foam in it. If you go with the larger sheet foam, you have the option to use the case just like that if you have a narrow rifle. Let's say you have something like a, a standard sporter weight hunting rifle with a smaller scope on it. You can just remove the bolt and you can drop that rifle in the case and close it and the foam will compress and hold that rifle fairly well centered in the case. Um, you have to be wary of the bolt. The bolt can slide around from time to time since it's well rounded on both sides. It can slide between those sheets and end up pressed up against your rifle. I've seen that happen before, so be cautious about that. But the rifle itself, you can just drop it in there and close the case. Now, if you have a larger tactical rifle, when you try to do that, you're really going to have to mash that case down to get the latches locked. And that'll cause a lot of stress on the case. It also takes up some of the protective room of the case. If that case gets crushed, it's going to apply more force down onto the rifle. So on a larger tactical rifle, I really prefer to cut that inner layer of foam out to match the shape of the rifle. Now you don't have to be perfect because that foam does compress. Uh, you can send it off and have uh, it professionally cut. Uh, I believe Bauer Cases was one that I've recently looked at that does an exceptional job with laying everything out and getting that foam cut just perfect. When you open it up, it's really a showpiece. It's really beautiful to behold when you have all your stuff laid out like that. But I'm more of a utilitarian mind. My case just gets beaten up. Um, if it gets busted up, I really don't want to have a lot of money invested in it. I just really want to ship it off, get a replacement case, and go again. So I go the cheap route. I just throw that sheet of foam down, lay my rifle on top of it. I'll take a silver Sharpie, 
trace the rifle out with the silver sharpie and then I'll get one of the long uh, disposable razor utility knives and I'll open that knife up and I'll just use that blade to cut the outline, the silver sharpie that I've drawn the pattern on the foam. Um, it doesn't come out super pretty. It's kind of jagged. You'll get little spots where you have to pull the foam away, but it works. Uh, the rifle will drop down in there. The rifle will be protected. The rifle itself you want as centered in the case as possible. There's really no rule of thumb on how close to the edge of the case you need to get it. Tactical rifles can take a pretty good hit without being damaged, but I want a good deal of room around that rifle. That's why I don't like to pack a lot of accessories in there. Um, the scope needs to go towards the handle. That way, if somebody's carrying it and drops it, it's the bottom of the rifle that takes most of the pressure of the hit and not the scope. So always have the scope towards the handle, not towards the hinges. Um, other than that, lay it out how you see fit. Uh, I usually remove the bolt and either have a separate pocket for the bolt or have some other way to hold the bolt in the rifle. That way you don't have that bolt handle sticking out to the side if, again, something runs over your case and crushes it. You don't want to end up with a bolt handle broken off or you don't want to end up causing damage to the rifle itself because that bolt handle was sticking out to the side. Most of the cutting is just for looks. You can do a, a really you know, quick and easy job at home. And it's not gonna look pretty. It's not anything that's gonna be worthy of a magazine cover, but it'll work. It'll get your rifle to where you're going safe and sound. Matthew asks, maybe another update on the long-term performance of your Falcon Menace if you're still using it. I'm thinking about getting one and I think your last update was 2009. Well, Matthew, the Falcon Menace 4 to 14 by 44 first focal plane rifle scope that we got quite some time ago is still riding on a Remington 700 and 308. Um, it originally was on that rifle. It got replaced by US Optics SN3. That scope then went on my AR-10. I shot it on the AR-10 for a while, and now it found its home back on that 700 because that's not a primary rifle. It's just a fun rifle that I take out. Uh, the scope still tracks accurately. It still works just fine. It's got uh, quite a few thousand rounds underneath it now, and I really haven't had any problems with it. Now, that scope, I can say, is a very good budget option. However, the problem is I have not been able to evaluate any of the current scopes, and we purchased that scope quite some time ago, so there is the possibility that there have been some quality changes. Um, there are some definite design changes in the scope, since that first one. The first one had a mill dot reticle and it had MOA turrets on it. So it was a mixed reticle and turret configuration. The latest offerings, you can get them with mill turrets and mill reticles, but we have not had the chance to get one in our hands and actually do a tracking drill on those mill turrets. So I can't tell you with any degree of certainty if those turrets are gonna track accurately. We have attempted to work with Falcon to get one of their latest scopes in. Uh, we filled out a bunch of importer paperwork. We were talking to them, and then the conversation just kind of ceased. So I'm not sure where we're at on those. But since those scopes have to be imported from the UK, it takes a little bit more effort to try to get one in for T&E. As soon as we get one of the latest scopes in, we'll make sure that we go ahead and do a review so you guys can check that out. We also do have another budget scope option coming up from the Millet line. So if you guys keep an eye on our reviews, we'll have that up sometime in the next few months. Jerry asks, I would like to get some tips on breaking new shooters on the habit of flinching. I would also really like your thoughts on the pros and cons of fixed versus variable power scopes. Well, Jerry, on the fixed versus variable power, uh, we've gone into great detail on that in the past. I will leave a link in the description on an article that I actually wrote on the fixed versus variable power um, topic. Now, as far as fixing a flinch in a shooter, the most common way to do that is called a ball and dummy drill. And what you'll do is you'll get the shooter down on the rifle and you'll have them dry fire. I usually like to have them dry fire 10 to 20 times just to get comfortable behind the rifle and get their mind in the shooting game. Then what you'll do is tell them that you're gonna place a cartridge in the chamber while they have their eyes closed. Place the cartridge in, close the bolt for them, and then they're gonna go through the firing task at that point. They will not know if the cartridge that you placed in the chamber is a live cartridge or a dummy cartridge until they press the trigger. 
Now what this will do is if they are expecting a live cartridge and they have a flinching problem and they drop the hammer on a dummy, you will visibly see the flinch. I mean, it's usually very well pronounced. Um, after a couple of times of doing this, it really, when you do it as a shooter, because I've done ball and dummy drills before and had a flinch, um, you feel really silly when it occurs. And part of that helps you to break that habit. So what I'll generally do is give them a live cartridge, give them any number of dummy cartridges after that. So they really work on getting rid of that flinch. Then drop another live cartridge in when I think they're ready and let them fire that. And what you will generally see is first of all, the live cartridge that they fire when they were expecting a dummy will be more accurate than when they are expecting a live cartridge. Uh, you will also see that after a while, the flinch will go away. They won't exhibit the flinch anymore on the dummy cartridges. So it's a really good drill. Uh, you can do this any time you think that they're developing a flinch. Another thing that I like to do if I get a shooter who is starting to get gun shy, they're starting to get kind of afraid of that blast, I will remove the blast from the situation. I will put them on a suppressed 22 and shoot them on a suppressed 22. And that way we are still getting the whole mechanics of it, the whole fundamentals of marksmanship, but we have removed the recoil and we have removed the muzzle blast. So now they can just go through it and concentrate on putting the crosshairs where they need to be, concentrate on that trigger press, the follow through, the breathing, all the fundamentals, and not worry about uh, getting a nasty report when they fire the rifle. So those are some options to you. If you want a really cheap and easy one, put them on a BB gun. Uh, I don't like BB guns because they generally the triggers are gritty and ugly and nasty and you have to go through some added steps in order to ready the rifle, but BB guns are generally cheaper than investing in a whole nother 22 rifle, so do what you have to do there. But ball and dummy drills are primary. Uh, we generally do that in uh, military or law enforcement units where they're restricted with the equipment that they can use and they generally don't have 22s or BB guns or stuff like that available. Hope that answers your question on that. Mike asks, tactical matches, what's the best way to shoot the mover? Well, Mike, the best way to shoot the mover is going to depend solely upon the tactical problem at the time. Uh, what I generally like to do is I like to dial my elevation for the range of the mover, be it 200, 300, 500 yards, etc. I'll dial my elevation for that range and then I will hold for my lead and for my wind. Because if you have a left to right wind blowing, say you need to do a three tenths hold, well then you're going to be holding that three tenths ahead one direction, in the other direction you're going to have a negative lead on the target. So you really want to be holding so that no matter which direction the target moves, you can base on that. Some guys will dial for the wind so that they don't have to worry about that in their lead, but wind is not a constant thing and you don't want to have that lead dialed in and then have the wind drop off while you're trying to engage the mover and now you have to recompute everything in your head. So it's easier just to remember that if we have a 3 tenths mil lead, or I'm sorry, if we have a 1.5 mil lead and we have a 3 tenths mil wind, then going one direction, I'm going to lead 1.8. Going the other direction, I'm going to lead 1.2. I hope that is not too confusing. Now, how to figure out your lead is going to be solely dependent upon you shooting movers. Uh, what we see very often, lead is a combination of the time of flight it's going to take for the bullet to get there and also your personal lock time, the amount of time it takes for your brain to decide to fire the rifle and for your finger to pull the trigger. So my personal lock time on a standard walking moving target, and that's where the guy turns the popsicle and steps off, is approximately 1.5 mils. Uh, and that generally works out anywhere from 100 to 600 yards uh, because of the time of flight and the range. It, it just generally works out that way. You don't have to change your lead based upon the range that the target's at. Now beyond that, when you start to really stretch out, if you're shooting movers at 1,000 yards, then it's really going to be a crap shoot at that point. Um, so it's, it gets really dicey. What you're going to need to do at that point is try to spot impacts and adjust based upon that. Um, 
if the mover changes speed, again, you're just going to have to adjust. Um, sometimes you can watch through the reticle, and if you have a large amount of room that the mover is going to move over, you can watch through the reticle, get an idea of what your time of flight is, and see how far the target moves in that time of flight. But generally, what I end up doing, even if I go to the line with that plan in my head, is I just swag it, throw around downrange, see where the puff of dust comes up, and adjust based upon that. The best way to get good at movers is to shoot movers. There's really no way to practice it without actually having somebody go down behind a berm, stick a target up over a berm, and move that target. Um, it's just the only way to get better at it. So I hope that gives you a little bit of insight. Uh, generally, if you are starting out shooting them and they are walking, standard walking movers, I suggest you start with a 1 to 1.5 mil lead and that will help you figure out where your personal lead is based on that. Hugie asks, Hi John, I'm currently planning a build. My question is on barrel grade. I don't want to worry much about my budget, but I don't want to spend more than I need. Shillin gives you a choice of both match grade and select match grade, which is about 30% more expensive. Is an intermediate shooter like myself going to benefit noticeably from a higher grade barrel? Well, I haven't really shot the shillin match grade and select grade side by side to be able to tell you if there is any noticeable difference in the accuracy of those rifles. I really haven't shot a lot of shillin barrels, period. Uh, what I would suggest though, because even a 30% price difference when you're talking about a blank which runs around $300, uh, that really isn't all that much money. When you're going to end up spending the most money is on having the barrel installed, having the action trued, all this stuff. So what I would suggest is purchasing the highest grade barrel that you can afford at the time you do the installation. That money is generally not going to be poorly spent. And if you're doing something like a 308 barrel, you're going to have that barrel for quite some time. So go ahead and spend the money now. When we're talking about spending a dollar or more a shot going down that barrel and a barrel that's going to last you conceivably eight to 10,000 rounds, then it may be advantageous to go to the more expensive barrel. Now, I notice here in your question, you said you're building a 6.5. That barrel's going to have a little bit less barrel life. But if you're going to a cartridge like that and you're going to a high-end build with the TAC-30 uh, action, you might as well spend the extra 30% and get the best barrel that you can get. TJ asks, how about protecting your gear, as in hard cases versus soft case, selecting the right case for your rifle? How much room should you have at the ends of the rifle to the sides of the case? What about range bags? What sort of bag do you recommend and what do you need to pack it in? Well, TJ, I answered part of that question in uh, Ryan's question about Pelican cases. My view on the hard case versus soft case is I use a hard case if I'm going to have to mail a rifle, ship a rifle, or fly with a rifle. Mainly because with flying with a rifle, the hard case is a federal requirement. But then secondly, because the rifle will be out of my control, so I have no idea what's going to happen to it. Uh, we've all watched baggage handlers just beat the heck out of stuff. We've seen the condition it's come out in on the conveyor at the end of the trip. So I want to afford the rifle the most protection I can possibly give it while it's outside of my control. Now, in my opinion, for driving from the house to the range, a hard case is overkill. It just makes things harder than necessary. It's big, it's bulky. The, a hard case for a full-size tactical rifle doesn't fit really well in most of the current mid to full-size cars. So. I generally recommend some kind of soft case to transport a rifle to and from the range. Uh, drag bags are nice. The new uh, Triad Tactical Precision Rifle Carry Case that we are reviewing now um, is a great option. And it's just a soft case that's got a good bit of padding to help for the bumps and the bangs. And it gives you some room to throw in your accessories, your staples, your targets, uh, your bullets, your uh, bag and your shooting mat, all that extra stuff. Um, what I generally use when I am just going out to the range to shoot for the fun of it, I'm not shooting video, not dragging all the video equipment along, is I use my Everly Stock X3 pack. It's got the scabbard in the back of it. I'll just throw a rifle in the scabbard. 
It already carries the gear that I use for a regular range day. Uh, I've got my shooting mat strapped to the bottom of it, so I just take that whole rig, throw it in the back of the pickup truck, and drive to the range. Uh, the padding in the X3 is not enormous, but it's enough to protect a tactical rifle from the average bumps and bangs. Now, if I'm taking something nice like my 40XB with a walnut stock on it, I want to protect that stock a little bit more from bangs. Uh, so I will put it in a well-padded carry case, again, like the uh, Precision Rifle carry case. And that way it is protected from any sharp angles, from dropping anything on it, or from bouncing around on the back of the truck. That's really about it. Uh, there are a ton of different brands of carrying cases out there. There are a ton of different grades of drag bags and cases from the cheap Chinese stuff to the extremely high quality American made stuff. And I will tell you, you get what you pay for. Um, you may be able to purchase a cheap Chinese drag bag that does the job I have in the past, uh, but when you compare that to high-end American stuff, you really notice that there is a difference in the quality of the two. And in the end, it's what your wallet can afford. It's, the, it's what you want to pay for. Adrian asks, what's going on with your 6.5 slash 6 millimeter projects? Well, the 6 millimeter side, the 243 Winchester barrel that I put on the AE Mark II, it is actually sitting underneath the table right now in storage until I get done shooting up the ammo that I had loaded for the Oregon Sniper Challenge. Uh, once I get done expending that ammo, since it was loaded specifically for the AE Mark II with the 308 barrel on it, uh, we'll put the 243 barrel back on the AE and continue to shoot that until it's burned out. Uh, the 243 on the AE Mark II is an excellent choice, is really a great long range tactical rifle. Now, on the 6.5 front, some of you guys saw the uh, pictures we posted up on our Facebook page with the Remington 260 barrel. It's actually an AAC SD pre fit 260 barrel for a Remington 700. Uh, that is just on hold for right now. We'll be getting to that here shortly. But we've got some other things going on. We have a shop that is going to be doing a rebuild on one of our Remington 700s. And so that has tied up uh, one of the actions that we had actually intended to use for that barrel. So we've got to wait till we have the budget to grab another Remington 700 action before we can start on that project. John asks, when do you use holdovers and when do you dial up? Well, John, that's a really simple answer, and the when I use holdovers is when I need to be fast. When I dial up is when there is really no time limit, and I want the most precision I can get. Um, there are a lot of times in tactical matches where you really need to transition from target to target to target as quick as possible, and it's a whole lot easier for me to have a range card laying next to me and just glance off to the side of my stock at my range card without breaking position, without having to reach up and dial, and then hit that next target. Um, if I have all the time in the world, I love to dial because it gives me that extra precision. It takes a little bit more error out of the shot because reticles, if you have a reticle that is broken down really fine, it gets really hard to see those fine increments. So my reticles are generally broken down into quarter mil or two tenth mil increments. Uh, sometimes they're broken down in both two tenths and three tenths, depending on what kind of reticle you're running. Uh, some of the horse reticles are broken down really weird, so it just depends. But I prefer to hold when time's on the line, and I prefer to dial when I have all the time in the world. Rich asks, how bad a hit do you take when using one scope between two rifles with a, quick, with a set of quick release rings? Is there a setup that doesn't require a re-zero with each scope move? Well, there are quick release rings out there that will help you retain the zero setting that you have on the scope that won't actually require you to re-zero, but what, what you will have to do is you will have to note what your zero setting is for one rifle and then what your zero deviation is when you move that scope to the other rifle. And you have to keep very close track of that because you'll have to move it, dial the deviation in, re-zero your turrets, and shoot on that rifle. When you're going back, you have to make sure that you dial that deviation in the opposite direction, re-zero the turrets, and then you're good to go. It can get very confusing and it's very easy to get off 
to where now you have to go out and actually reshoot and re-zero. Additionally, the problem that you'll run into with going between something like an M1A and a Remington 700 is the height over the bore. On that M1A, you're going to be running a higher height over bore depending upon your base setup and your ring setup. Going over to the Remington 700, that may require you to have an adjustable cheek piece. It's all going to depend upon the setup between the two rifles. It's completely and totally doable but it adds complexity to the situation and many times you'll end up spending more on a quality quick release system than you would getting a cheaper scope for whichever system you don't shoot as often. Michael asks, my zero dropped about three quarter inch after cleaning my bore. I'm assuming it's due to reduced velocity and after removing copper fouling. Is such a drop typical and should work back up to the old fouling level or re-zero? Well, Michael, it is very typical to find what is called a cold, clean bore deviation. And that's when you clean your bore, you get rid of all that copper and all that fouling. It does change the velocity of the bullet, and the bullet does have to lay that copper back down before things go back to normal. So you will generally see a deviation. That deviation should go away, even if you're shooting a rough factory Remington barrel uh, after the first couple of shots. Now what I generally see with factory rifles is after you've scrubbed that barrel completely clean is it can take up to 20 shots for the rifle to return to its peak accuracy. However, the shots will center around that previous zero. So you shouldn't have to re-zero the rifle, you should just shoot it in and you will refoul it and get back to that previous point. Now as far as if a three quarter inch drop is normal, they can be all over the board. I've seen lateral deviation, vertical deviation, uh, it just totally depends. Uh, so just shoot it, when you clean it, expect that you're going to have to put some rounds through it before that peak accuracy will return and before you'll get that zero back. This is why if you do this as a profession, you need to either decide that you're going to keep your rifle fouled, which is what I prefer to do or you're going to have to take very careful notes and note very precisely what your cold clean bore deviation is. Daniel asks, tips on compensating scope for switching between unsuppressed fire. Well, I'm planning on actually doing a video here shortly in the future about going between unsuppressed and suppressed on the same rifle. Basically what you will need to do is take your rifle, I suggest shooting it first unsuppressed, getting that perfect zero, then installing the suppressor and shooting several groups with the suppressor on, and note what the deviation is with the suppressor on. Jot that down in your data book, and now that you know, when you install the suppressor, you're automatically going to have to come up, say, two tenths, and write two tenths to compensate for the suppressor being on the barrel. Uh, some rifles have a greater point of impact shift than others, but the key thing that you want to note with your system is that you have a reliable point of impact shift. Um, some suppressors, if they're placed on barrels maybe that weren't threaded the greatest or maybe a lot of care wasn't taken in the assembly of that suppressor, then you can get a point of impact shift that's all over the place. If you're using a quick release type suppressor and the quick release doesn't return it exactly to zero, then you may also get a point of impact drift. So that's something that you want to go out and you'll test on your individual rifle and see. And the best way to test that is just shoot a group, take the suppressor off, reinstall the suppressor, shoot a group, and repeat for several different groups and then see what your uh, impact shift is. Hopefully you'll notice that it keeps going to the same place every time you remove and reinstall the suppressor. Finally, Toby asks, buying a custom action versus blueprinting a Remington 700 action in raceways. Also, the best budget rifle chassis that can accommodate a 700 style action for long range varmint shooting. What I generally would recommend is that if you have the money to do so and you're starting right off the bat building a precision rifle, then go with one of the aftermarket actions from Stiller, Surgeon, etc. Uh, this way you know you're getting a high quality product that was held to the best tolerance as possible and it was designed for a precision rifle application. Uh, Remington 700 off the shelf, an action that you would buy from Brownells or an action that would come on a rifle that you pick up at Walmart or Gander Mountain or Dick's, um, is not intended to be a precision rifle. Uh, they're really designed to hunting rifle specifications with the exception of some of Remington's custom rifle shop rifles, 
uh, they're not generally held to any specific accuracy tolerances. So you will need to have that rifle trued to an extent when you have a custom build done. Now, if you have a Remington 700 already in your possession, then you might as well send that off, use that for your build, and have it trued up because you're already money ahead invested in that action. Uh, the end product is going to be fairly accurate no matter which direction you go. It's just a matter of how much money you spend into it and what you want to actually do. If you're going to go to the trouble of having side bolt releases installed and uh, custom bolt knobs, things of that nature, then you may be money ahead with the custom action versus a factory Remington action. Um, lots of budget builders though, they're starting with an off-the-shelf rifle, so they already have that action. It's perfectly acceptable to send that action off, have that one trued up and go. We see a lot of custom Remington actions, I'm sorry, we see a lot of customized Remington actions on the line at precision rifle matches and they do just fine. We also see a ton of custom 700 footprint actions on the line. So just whichever way you want to go, you do the numbers based upon the things that you want to do and what your gunsmith is quoting you for the work and determine which one is the best financial option for you. As far as the best chassis to accommodate a 700 pattern action, there are a ton of them out there. There's the Whiskey 3 chassis, there is the XLR Evolution chassis, or the XLR Carbon chassis, there's the Rock Solid chassis. Um, they just, there are so many chassis out there. The key is going to be what you prefer. Do you prefer AR-15 ergonomics? Do you prefer a more traditional stock type? Do you prefer a vertical grip? You can even go into something now like the Manners Mini chassis where you can get a traditional fiberglass stock but it has an aluminum chassis system in it, so you drop it right in and it accepts a magazine system right off the bat. So really the sky is the limit on that. You have to base your budget on the features that you want and the type of layout that you want. There is no best as far as that's concerned. Just a ton of options for you. And that really is a good thing. It can be mind-boggling at first, but once you start to wade through it and see what you really want, what you really need, and what you can afford, they tend to kind of work themselves out. That's all the questions we have for this episode. I hope you found it useful. If you like the video, make sure you click that thumbs up button and please share our videos far and wide. It helps our viewers grow and that in turn helps us to get new products to review for you guys. If you're a subscriber, thank you very much. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. And until next time, get out and shoot!